5.6 preview is out, and that means a lot of new toys to play with. And I've gone ahead and started playing with them. And so I want to show you some cool tips and tricks that I've picked up going through the new features of 5.6 preview. And because it is preview, not everything is in, like GPU grass and micro scattering, the biome core stuff. Some of this GPU stuff isn't fully implemented yet. It is going to be once it is fully released, but just know that this stuff does have some stuff not fully functional. So just keep that in mind. But that won't stop me from showing you some cool things I found digging through the new 5.6 stuff. And if you are not familiar with the new 5.6 features, I did make a video going all through the PCG nodes, as well as some extra ones, which you can check out right here if you haven't. And then what I'm gonna be showing here will make probably a bit more sense. So let's get into it. So here is the new PCG graph. Now, some things are going to seem absolutely the same, other parts are going to be a little bit different. Starting with, with nothing selected on the right here, we no longer have a parameter section. We have now an instance section and then open graph parameters where I can click on that. And then I can open this graph parameters, which by default is just floating out here. So now I can put my graph parameters wherever I'd like. And I can go ahead and add the parameters as I want. I can go ahead and click this icon to change the type. Let's say I want this to be Boolean. I can double click on the name to change the type. And I can change this, click this icon to make it private or public. Now, this is different than the eye icon in a blueprint. All the variables are still exposed. This does not change whether they're exposed. This just makes it private or public. But now we can also reorder this. It's all great. We can change the values, all the normal things. And the cool thing is we can dock this. So I can grab this and let's say I can dock it right here on the right side if I wanted to, or I can rip it out and put it somewhere else. I will dock it over here on the left for the time being and then reorganize this. And then the other new thing is under window, we have data viewport and I can get data viewport one, which gets us this screen right here. And I'll actually just put it right here on top of the graph parameters. That is good enough for me. So you have kind of a nice breakdown where you can see the graph parameters, the data viewport, and then the detail panel on the right. The bottom here hasn't really changed much, but we'll still go over some of the new changes. Now, how does this work? If I go ahead and create a points grid node, and I press D, nothing will happen. It doesn't show anything. If I press A, nothing will happen because it's not in the world. So the first note is this data viewport will show only when something is in the viewport. To make it work, all you do is take our graph and drag it out into the viewport. And it doesn't matter where it is. I can put it up, down. That, that part doesn't matter. The main thing is it's in the world now, which means I still cannot press D to get it. But D, as always, will have it appear inside the actual world. But if I press A to get the point information, you can see, there you go. There's our data viewport working and there's all our points. So there you go. So now that is working as we want. And because of this, you can only preview one at a time. The other thing to note is it does not show you the actual ground plane. It shows you relative to the points, which means that if I use a transform points node and in this transform points node, I'll move things up 5,000 units in the air on Z and then press A on this, you will see it is still on the ground. It doesn't look like it's moved up at all because relative to itself, this is the lowest point. So it's putting it on the ground. If I press D on these points, you will see they're up in the air. So that's something to keep in mind. If I do a simple merge points node here, which does have a new setup here, and I plug both of them into the input and I press A, you can see now we're getting both of them in here. So now we have the bottom ones and the ones we moved all the way up, uh, up into the air I move them down a bit less and give them some variation here. You can see we now get the full effect. Again, if we delete it and just use this, it puts it back on the ground. So just something to keep in mind when you're using this and you're doing an offset vertically, this is what happens. Now, if you do it horizontally, let's say I move these 1000 units in X, that actually works. Here, I'll push it further to 5000 units in X and you can see the X and Y will work just fine. It is the Z that will continually update to the lowest point. So this is important to keep in mind when you're using this, don't worry about the height or just have an original point somewhere where it's also part of it to get you your baseline. So just something to keep in mind. I'll go ahead and remove these parameters, which is doing a remove here through the little carrot and then hitting remove. And now let's go over metadata domains. Metadata domains are basically variables that are not attached to the points, but they're attached to the data of the points. 
it'll be easier to for me to show you. With this transform still select, you can see it has a bunch of information here. All these points have a different seed, for example. And what I can do is drag out and search for add attribute using the parameter version. And here we can go ahead and add a attribute here. And so this is already going to be a new thing that I can show you, which is if we go ahead and add a new parameter here, let's say this is just our float value that we're going to want. The flow value, let's say, is going to be uh, 420.69. That is our value. What we can do is, as before, get float val, and we can plug that in. And then in the add attribute, we can change the output target. We can give the same name, float val. If I press A on this add attribute and scroll to the right, we have our float value, 420.69. It does not require us to actually put anything in here. We can turn that off, turn off, copy all attributes. And you can see here it is still. Now this isn't new, but what is new is the fact that this value, I can right click and do convert node and can make it a constant or a graph parameter. Now let's go to constant first. That gets us the same thing as if you went to create attribute and plugged in the values here. The only difference is it automatically puts in the output target, the name of the variable. So if I want to use this variable, but then you know what? I want to make a slight change to it, but I don't need it as a saved variable for whatever reason. I can use a constant. It'll put everything in for me and I can work from that as a default. I can also, for example, have a constant, let's say I've configured it. I want it to be a Boolean and I want it to be a pineapple on pizza. And we're going to turn it on to true. This is our setup. I can right click on this and convert it to a graph parameter, which will by default automatically create a variable in our graph parameters. That is a bool pineapple on pizza that is set to true. So you're able to quickly convert variables to static and static to variables. Very handy, but it gets even better. If I right click a pineapple and pizza, I can convert it to this graph parameter generic. If I select this, I get this nifty variable. I can also get it by just searching get graph parameter. Same thing. This one's just automatically configured for pineapple and pizza. So on this node, you can see our property path is the variable name. And our output name is also the variable name by default. We can, of course, name it whatever you want. But the nifty thing is, if I press A on it, you can see I have just pineapple and pizza on this one. If I press A on the default version that has nothing in the property path, you will see we have the original float value and pineapple on pizza. We have both of them. And so what we can do, if we needed to, we can take this and plug it into our add attribute. And guess what? If we have copy all attributes selected and I press A on add attribute and scroll to the right, there's our float value and there's pineapple on pizza. Both of them have been added. It is now adding everything in the graph parameters, which is pretty nifty. But of course, there's some limitations and some more extras. If I add a new variable here and let's make this one, for example, a simple vector, I guess double click on the new property name and just rename it to let's say offset. The offset can be 100 in the Z. Inside of this add attribute, without me changing anything, I can now scroll further into the right, and now there's offset X, Y, and Z. So that's something to keep in mind, that the graph parameter, if you do copy everything, will actually update if you ever add a new variable, which might be good, might be bad. You have full control over whether you want to grab one specific one and add it versus all of them. And if I want to grab just offset, I can spe specify offset, output name, offset, and now you can see I only have the offsets here. And that's because I, again, I have to do copy all attributes. If I did not copy all attributes and I left it by default on blank, so the graph parameter gets me everything, but the add attribute then returns me specifically the last thing. And because the output target of add attribute is none, that's why we have none.z. If I change this to offset, now we have offset XYZ, but it grabs the last one. And if that means if I reorder this, which I can do just by clicking and dragging, it doesn't change. It is the last one created. It is not the last one in order. You might think it's the last one in order, but no, it doesn't actually affect it like that. Again, I've just reorganized it here. I press A on get graph parameter. In the graph parameter, it is still flow value, pineapple and pizza, and then offset, despite our parameters here being reorganized. So just something to keep in mind if you go with that method. Reorganizing the variables is kind of a visual thing for you. It is not changing the order of them under the hood. One last thing about the graph parameter node, it does not support arrays. If I change this to an array, let's say I change this float value by right clicking on this drop down, I can change to an array and I can add a new setup here and say first one is going to be 
69. Next one is going to be 420. So you can see when I would turn on copy all attributes now, I still only got offset and pineapple on pizza. And in the graph parameter, I only have offset and pineapple on pizza. I do no longer have this float value. The only way to get this one is by using just the get float value, getting this one. If I press A on it, you could see I have multiple indexes, 69, 420, and I can do a simple match and set attributes with this float value. And if I press A on match and set attributes and scroll to the right, you can see there's a float value randomizing between 420 and 69 on every point. So you can absolutely still use arrays. It's just you cannot use them in, with a graph parameter. Also, if I was to rename one of the variables, it will automatically update this one, but not the one in here. If I had a property path that is hard coded, it will not automatically update it. But if you like to play around with this different variables and you want to try this or that or that, the get graph parameter might be really nice because you just specify, okay, you know, let's try with this variable, then with this variable, then with this variable, without having to do a get node for every single one and plugging it in, taking it out, etc. So now let's go finally into the metadata stuff. I'm going to add a new parameter. I'm going to add pineapple and pizza to the metadata. So what I'm going to do is just use a simple add attribute, just like we did before. But this time what I'm going to do is go to the graph parameters, I'm going to click on this little icon where on the left where it becomes a hand. I'm going to click on it and drag it out. This automatically gets us a get node for that parameter, which is super handy. And I can just plug it in just like so. And on the add attribute, we can now customize where this goes. So the input source is last, which is just what is being input. The output target, I'm going to type in at data dot, and then the name of the attribute that I want to call it, pineapple on pizza, and I press enter. And then if I press A on this, you'll see we still have the offset pineapple on pizza and float value, but that's because it's from the previous stuff. I'm going to go ahead and detach it. I'm going to plug it in much earlier on before we added all the other stuff to show you what happens. So on this add attribute, we no longer have all the extra stuff, but we added it to pineapple on pizza here. The way to see that now is by going here. You see where it says points? That now also has a data section. And on the data, we have now pineapple on pizza set to true. So that's awesome. All of these points have a separate data variable that is separated from the point information. It still follows the points. If I was to use a point filter, and then I say if it is equal to the index of zero, so literally only the first one will come here, so let's use a simple debug here and press A on the debug. You'll see it only has a one point that index zero and under points, it still has the data on pineapple and pizza being true. And if I do the same thing on the outside filter, again, it has all the rest of the points. And again, the data comes along with it. So more than anything, this is a good way of just organizing things. Sometimes you just need to know if a group of points is something. And if it's the same value for all of the points, maybe putting it on the data is convenient. Now let me show you what happens when you have multiples. So if I go ahead and remove these, and I'll just do another add attribute here for a different, it's the same kind of points, but we'll just do in a separate data. On this one, I'm going to just change this data to be add data and then offset. And instead of pineapple on pizza, I'm going to drag the offset and plug that in here. So these points have the offset and these ones have the pineapple on pizza. If I now do a merge points and plug both of them in and press a on the merge points under data you can now see it has now pineapple on pizza and the original so the data follows along but now keep in mind that all of the points now have both you can of course play around with a bit more there's certain intricacies to all of this but that's kind of the basic idea of metadata domains the next thing i want to show you is regarding the debugging features that were added in what i'm going to do is make a new graph here i'm going to right click ecg ecg graph I'm going to call this a underscore marker and you'll see why in just a second. Then I'll take that a marker, drag it in and just create a regular subgraph node. It has nothing in here. If I go in, you can see it does absolutely nothing, but that's fine. What I want to show you is in our main graph, because it is here, we now have this a marker subgraph zero. We have two buttons here show the calling node. If I click it, it zooms to it. And if I press the next button, it opens it up. Very convenient. But here's the reason why I called it a marker. Because I can now rename this by pressing F2 to, let's say, get points. And if I click down on the bottom left, it'll update it. And you'll see it says a marker, get points. And if I duplicate this, and I let's say I rename this one to add data attributes. And I, let's say I'll just move it right over here. Again, it's not connected to anything. And you need to probably click force region if it doesn't update. 
then I'll make it update the names here. We can now see that now we have add data attributes and get points. And now I can just click this icon, no matter where I am in the graph, and I can just go find the original start. Okay, so now I'm using it, even though it's made for debugging, I can use it as a way of just snapping to certain locations really quickly between each other because I'm just using it as a marker. Now, absolutely, you could use this for debugging, which is its intended purpose, but I found this use case to be also quite handy if you have a big graph. Comments are great, but that makes you still need to zoom out, zoom in. This, because of the convenient button here, show the calling node in the current graph, it will automatically just zoom you into that right area and be like, okay, this is the area. And now I can jump between the two. Super convenient. I thought it'd be a good idea to share it with you guys. Another new thing showed off was this template graphs. It says it is an easy way to pre-configure graphs for users of a system relying on PCG or providing examples. The main thing about it is all you need to do is with nothing selected up in the top right, you can just turn in is template and check that on. That's all you need to do. And when you do that, the next time you try to create a PCG graph of any kind, it'll show up this. You can see PCG graph changes. That is the graph that I called the original one. I can still create an empty graph by clicking this, but the main thing is I can select it and click initialize from template, and then I can open it up. And here's the thing. It is just the same graph. It is the same graph with the same variables, with everything being the same. It is absolutely no different than if you were to just duplicate the original graph. The only difference is you didn't have to go looking for it. So yes, a bit convenient, but nothing special aside from effectively being just a duplicate of the graph that you don't need to look. In case you were thinking it was something more than it is. And if I don't want to, I can turn off is template again. And then when I go ahead and try to make a new PCG graph, it'll just go ahead and create in one. And lastly, I just want to show you some spline things because we can use the data also with splines now, which is really cool. I'm just going to use a create points node to create four points so I can use those in a spline. I can press A on these and get the original points here. Then from here, I can do a simple create spline. And again, I can press A on the create spline and I can get the points of the spline. Again, we can do great, great data only. We'll make a closed loop. I can make linear if I'd like to, etc. But the main thing is we now have a spline and down below you can see here are all the spline points. We have the arriving and leaving tangents, location, rotation. This is all great, but we also now have control points, which are the four points here and data. And in the data by default, we have the position of the spline itself that is holding the information as well as whether it's closed or not. And we can actually modify this information. So if we search for add attribute to just do a simple math operation of add, this will also show us a new thing, which are our inline constants, which is awesome. We no longer have to plug in a variable every time. And you can change what kind of constant it is by right clicking and changing it to, let's say, a vector. And you can see now we have a vector type. Now it's giving us an error because it's complaining about the at last here for input source one. So let's change that. I want to change the at last to spline because now we have an option for points and splines and we can do control points or global. The global ones are the data points. You can see spline transform. If I select that, it'll still throw an error because it is not a vector. A transform is everything. It is the location, rotation, scale it is all of this information together so what i really want is this line transform dot position and as soon as i type in that for whatever reason it turns red but if i was to put offset it down by 500 in the x and press a on the add you can see its position x has been updated you can see there's our spline has been moved 500 units to the right if i make this 5000 you can see it is now way out there so it is working I'm not sure why it turns red though. And the interesting thing is if I duplicate it and just do the same thing on the next node, the next node is not red. This node is red, this one isn't. But this allows us to really quickly modify the full length of the spline, the full position of it without modifying every single point because obviously the points are relative to the position of the original spline they created. Which also means if this was a complicated spline, let's say it had like a bunny shape, you could now rotate the entire spline and keep it a bunny shape really easily because now you can just rotate the spline data, which is super awesome. And 5.6, of course, still has a bunch more stuff. Some things are waiting for the actual full release to be fully implemented, at which point I'll, of course, look into it and cover it and show you guys everything I know and everything I will learn. So if you're interested in that kind of stuff, make sure you subscribe so you don't miss it. And of course, like all of my tutorials, the project files for this will be going on my Patreon, where you can join these wonderful people here and supporting what I do. It really means a lot. And if you'd like to join the community, the link to the Discord will be down below as always. And if you're looking for more awesome PCG tutorials, 
check out this one right over here that I think you're really going to enjoy.